Welcome everyone to this live webinar on cybersecurity hosted by One Digital. I'm Jeannie Kane, and I'm a certified financial planner based in our Booton, New Jersey office. Now, Cybersecurity Awareness Month is October, so we're thrilled to have you join us today as we dive into this crucial topic. You know, as we spend more and more time in a digital world, understanding how to protect us, ourselves online has really never been more important. And without further ado, I'm excited to introduce our special guest today, Ariel Weintraub. Now, Ariel is the Chief Information Security Officer at Aon, where she's responsible for the company's global cybersecurity program. She's a seasoned cybersecurity expert with years of experience protecting financial services and insurance organizations. We're really excited to have Ariel here today, and she's going to walk through three key things with us. The first she's going to talk about is how to safeguard your personal and financial information. And then second, she's going to talk through the latest cybersecurity and identity theft threats. And finally, she's going to talk through steps to take if your identity has been compromised. Now, if you have any questions, please submit them through the Q&A feature, and we'll address them in the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Ariel, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Jeannie, and thanks, everyone. Appreciate you being here, and thanks for having me. Uh, as mentioned, this is actually Cybersecurity Month, so always a great time to talk about cybersecurity, what to do uh, in our personal lives, in our work lives, uh, at home with our families. But this month in particular is one of the best months to reinforce some of those messages. So I'm excited to talk to you about this today and happy to answer any questions at the end. So as mentioned, let's start first about what can we do to protect ourselves before we start talking about kind of what are those threats that we're protecting against. So the first thing is to remember that we use our identity in a lot of different ways in our in our everyday lives. So we may not even think about some of the places that we may need an online ad identity that we don't actually have one. So the best example I always come back to is life insurance. Uh, most companies that offer life insurance don't automatically enroll you in an online identity, uh, meaning an account, a digital account that you're going to a website to log into. Um, and so you should look into that in order to protect yourself. What that means is proactively register those online accounts, um, or actually if you prefer not to use an online account, if you prefer to leverage the call centers or if they have a physical mail option, most of the time, that's also fine. You should just uh, notify your provider of that, and they can typically put a block on the account to pre prevent somebody else from trying to register your identity. Um, you'll, you'd be surprised on how many times fraud actually occurs, particularly because the online digital account wasn't proactively uh, registered. So that's something to think about to work through all the list of uh, providers that you may not actually realize have an online capability that you haven't registered for. And now speaking of all the different accounts, you know, I, I hear this all the time, it's really hard to remember um, our passwords. And so it's very common to use the same password every time. I know I'm guilty of this also of forgetting our, my password, but there are a couple of things we can do so that we're protecting ourselves, but also at the same time, uh, making it a little bit easier. So first, and this is kind of the easiest of the tips, think about what we call a passphrase versus a password. So a password is um, maybe what you've historically been told is a good password, something that's not a word, something that has a lot of numbers, um, special characters, but harder to remember. Um, a passphrase is actually a longer, uh, think of it as a sentence. So maybe there is a little bit of complexity in that, meaning like maybe you start with a, a um, an uppercase letter, but actually when we think about a password and the strength of a password, the length is actually just as important as the complexity. So a 30 character password may actually be harder to crack than a shorter complex uh, password. And think about how much easier it is to just remember a whole sentence. And when we think about creating all these unique passwords for all of our sites, you know, you might be able to create sentences that are still unique to you, but maybe some kind of, you know, reminder or message that ties back to what site you're logging into that will help you remember that. Uh, but if you don't want to remember them, there are password managers that help you store them securely so that you can securely log in to each of those sites. Um, some of the examples we've listed here, LastPass, Keeper, 1Password, I'm sure there's more out there as well. 
But what's really important to not do is all of the browsers that we use um, often come with a capability to save the password in the browser so that the next time you go to that site, it's just going to automatically pre-populate that with your user ID, user ID and your password. Um, that's not the, the best way to do this. There are separate password managers like the ones that I mentioned here that are more secure. That browser-based one is more susceptible to be compromised. So as um, enticing as it is to use that feature, let's try not to do that and instead use one of these separate password managers. And then lastly, uh, many of these password managers actually will proactively tell you that one of the passwords you're currently using was found in what they call a dark web search. So in the dark web, there's um, uh, more visibility into breached uh, sites and all the usernames and passwords that were breached as part of that. Um, if you reuse your password, for example, you may have one of your current passwords exposed, which might lead you further exposed in an additional um, site. So if, if you do use one of these password managers, look for that feature and then uh, change those passwords when the password manager is telling you that one of your passwords has been identified in one of those data breaches. So let's move on. Um, other things that are important for protecting our online identity. So many, if not all, sites now also offer what we call multi-factor authentication or MFA. MFA essentially says you have to use two or more of these three things. Typically, the first is a password. So we always say these are the three categories, something you know, something you have, and something you are. So something you know is your password, something you have would be your phone or a token, and something you are would be your fingerprint or your facial recognition. So when we do two-factor authentication, we have to use one from two different categories. We can't have you know, both a fingerprint and your facial recognition because that's part of the same category. So uh, online uh, service providers will offer MFA, but oftentimes it is up to you to enroll in it. Some companies will require it, but more frequently it is as a consumer up to you to make that decision. So you should absolutely look into those capabilities and enroll as soon as possible on that. Um, uh, next, I don't know if uh, your home uh, uh, physical mail looks like mine, but I still get quite a lot of physical mail. Um, I know I'm opting in more and more times to only receive certain information digitally, but I'm still receiving quite a bit of sensitive documents at home. So when we're disposing of those documents, very important to physically shred them before we dispose of them uh, in the trash. And then lastly, there's lots of other really great tips at a uh, nonprofit organization, um, and the uh, newsletter and toolkit can be found at this site here, fightcybercrime.org. Uh, as a takeaway to today's webinar, in a follow-up email, there'll be access to these links, so you don't need to write them down here, uh, but definitely look into that afterwards. There's additional uh, ways to sign up to get uh, ongoing information and additional tools. Some more things that we can do to protect ourselves. So um, oftentimes your financial accounts will allow you to register for alerts. Um, these are unique for each type of uh, financial institution. The, I, I, the settings you know, are different. Um, so if you uh, uh, can't find it, of course, reach out to that provider to help you guide you to that. But there's usually some sort of alert center or settings in your profile that you can turn on to alert you on things like um, a disbursement made, um, a change of address, uh, things like that that might alert you to somebody having had compromised one of your accounts. And then um, lastly, um, thinking about the devices that we use to access these online accounts is um, our desktop software or our phones. Sometimes um, we have to opt in to automatically or to updating our software, and sometimes it's done automatically. Uh, ideally, you look for those ways to do it automatically. So for example, um, if you're using the Chrome browser, um, the Edge browser, those will automatically update. You don't need to worry about those software updates unless, of course, you disable it, which we don't recommend. And then similarly, depending on if you're running uh, Windows or um, 
uh, a Mac, you might have um, to also check for your operating system updates. And it's important that we keep these up to date because vulnerabilities are identified uh, all the time and then proactively um, what we call patched, which means we're fixing it in the operating system and then those updates are pushed out. So it's very important that we protect ourselves by keeping our, our devices up to date. Um, the best analogy I would give is it's like um, keeping our devices healthy, like our own health. Um, these are, you know, proactive, um, like flu shots, for example, that we're doing to keep the things that we use uh, healthy. We'll move on to our second section, uh, which I'll tell you is probably my most favorite thing to talk about, um, which is the landscape itself and what we're seeing. Um, I talk about this in my day job, um, which is uh, an evolving landscape. Um, unfortunately, there are new things that threat actors do every day, um, and we have to be agile in how we protect ourselves. And so I just like talking about kind of what those things are. Um, you might be surprised at this statistic, um, but according to the FTC, in 2023, consumers reported losing more than $10 billion uh, related to fraud. Um, and as we will we'll go through some of these slides here, you'll see why sometimes it is so easy to fall for some of these scams. So there's a three-step process that that we can use as a framework so that uh, we are protecting ourselves against some of these types of scams. First of all, we're all in a rush. I'm in a rush. Um, we have uh, you know, things going on with our families. We have things going on in our, in our work, uh, whatever we have going on, um, but it's important to slow it down. So um, kind of like the uh, old saying about a fire, like stop, drop, and roll, <laughs> kind of the same thing, like let's slow it down, let's stop, um, and when we act fast, that's often when we may not make the best um, decision. And so let's think through some of these things before we fall susceptible to one of these scams. So step two is that we want to really look into the details of the uh, type of scam that we might be falling susceptible to. So for example, one of the common um, attacks is via phone calls now. So uh, you're probably not expecting the IRS to call you, for example. Um, uh, so the, the trick here is that if you receive any sort of unexpected, whether it's a phone call, a text message, an email, anything that's claiming to be some sort of organization that you wouldn't expect to hear from, you should hang up um, or not respond to that email or text. And rather, we should go to the direct source to find um, the contact information to call them back to verify that that was legitimate. And then our third step is to always be weary of when somebody is asking you for payment. So a common scam is asking for gift cards or, you know, um, you've won an award, but in order to get the reward, you have to first pay, you know, $50 and that will be refunded later, for example. So if anything kind of sounds like either it's too good to be true um, or just anyone is asking you to send any sort of money up front, um, that's typically a very good uh, indicator that it's a scam. So let's talk about um, how to spot some of those scams um, and think think about as humans, you know, we are uh, we're easily what we call social engineered. That's the term that we use in uh, the industry, which means that people convince us to do things either because somebody is pulling on our heartstrings or, you know, we are excited. And so if you look at these three examples, um, the first is the urgency and um, the concern. So somebody's reached out and said, you know, I need something urgently um, and somebody just had an accident. Now, of course, you're going to want to help, right? Because as humans, we want to help people. Um, but then we see in, if we follow that three-step process, um, number three is, you know, be wary of sending of those gift cards. So in this case, if you think that the person that has text messaged you here um, if you know that person, um, then you should reach out to them in a different way um, to verify that. And, and probably in this case, you know, the, 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 the facts don't really make sense, right? So somebody just had an accident. Uh, gift cards are probably not the way that um, you're going to help that person. 
Um, the second, I kind of alluded to this before, is uh, a trip. So there are scams out there where um, you might think that you've won this great trip, and that might be such great news that day. Um, and uh, particularly in this example, you know, you start to think, hmm, I don't think I entered myself into one of those contests. Um, that's a good indicator that that's not a legitimate um, uh, reward that you've won. Uh, but you see here, you've you've won this reward, but now they're asking you to pay something, the tax and the fees. So now they're asking you for your credit card. That's a good indicator um, that something is not right there. And then the third is, you know, we all also want to be, uh, we typically want to be compliant, um, particularly with, you know, a, a government agency, for example. So this one, somebody is um, pretending to be part of the Social Security Administration. And so before they proceed, they're asking for some information such as your name. Now, you should never provide any sort of personal information, including just your name, to something on an, to someone on an unsolicited basis. So um, in this case, think about, you know, what the original source might be if they're claiming to be a particular organization, don't respond there. And you can go to the, um, find the website of the legitimate organization and contact them and let them know. So there's a lot of other types of scams out there too. Here's just some examples of categories of what those are. You know, in the online dating dating world, there have been scams related to um, pretending to be um, someone, and then it might lead into one of these other types of scams. For example, you might establish a relationship with somebody online that you haven't met with, and then they may ask later for you to send, you know, a gift card or something like that. The second one here is something that is quite common right now, um, and we actually talked about this with some peers earlier today, around job opportunities. So um, there's a number of you know sites, even things like LinkedIn, where you would think there'd be better um, profiling against identifying these illegitimate um, jobs, where people are posting not legitimate job opportunities and the way that the, that they then you know are using it to monetize is they offer you a job and then they ask for you know some personal information or in some cases they'll say great um you got the job we want to send you a laptop you need to just proactively pay you know two hundred dollars for the laptop and then we'll deduct it later from your paycheck things like that um, so you, you again, you'd be surprised how often um, those are are happening. Others, you know, fake charities to collect money. Again, pulling on our heartstrings, sent, telling a story that it's too hard to not uh, lean into. We we just really want to help that person. Um, another common one is an emergency. So pretending to be a family member that's in an emergency and is in um, drastic need of of some urgent um, financial support. Phone calls, um, text messages, those are other ways that scammers are using to deliver some of this um, information. Also, the last one on here I wanted to point out, technology support is also more common uh, these days. So somebody calls you and says that they've detected you have some sort of virus running on your on your uh, laptop and they'll help you remove that virus. All you have to do is you know, they're going to send you an email. You just need to click on the link and um, they'll they'll remove the virus for you. So oftentimes what happens in that case is that link gives them full access to your machine and now they've taken over your laptop to use in, in other ways. So these are all the kinds of things that are happening. And as I said at the beginning of this section, it's always evolving. And so it's always it's good to keep up to date on that newsletter, for example, that I mentioned earlier that will tell you more uh, and more what's happening. I think we talked about this, you know, a bit, but in terms of our um, providers, so they'll never directly ask you for your password. So if somebody reaches out and says, you know, I'm your bank, um, I uh, need your password to do this thing, you, your um, that should be a flag that this is not a legitimate request. You should hang up um, or not respond to the message, and you should call the company back via their official cha channel. By the way. The companies will appreciate that you're reporting this to them because if they don't know about it, then they also can proactively protect their other customers. So if you ever receive any sort of scam that's tied back to any sort of financial institution that you work with or, or any organization, they always appreciate that you inform them that there's some sort of scam that's impersonating them. 
Another common one, uh, I actually receive these texts all the time, is texts that I have a package that um, is being delivered or there was a delay in the delivery of a package. Uh, I need to click this link to coordinate the uh, the timely delivery to, to my house of this package. Um, again, if you know people send things all the time, you may not necessarily think you're expecting a package, but you might think, particularly around the holidays, you know, oh, somebody might be sending me a holiday gift. Um, and so you might fall uh, to that. So always be wary of those kinds of scams. Um, speaking of passwords earlier, so how I just wanted to give a little awareness of um, the how part. Um, so how, how would a, a hacker actually get access to your password. So one is uh, through what we call phishing. So phishing can be done through email or through texting. We call that smishing or uh, through a voice call. We call that phishing, bishing with a V. Um, these are all kinds of ways where a hacker will social engineer. That's what I mentioned earlier. We're trying to convince somebody to do something that um, will give them access to sensitive information They'll convince you to give them your password. So you receive an email, they pretend to be this bank, and they ask you to, um, maybe they say, you know what, your password's been compromised. You should log in here first with your current password, and then you can change your password. Well, now they've actually captured your, your real password. Um, another way is uh, what we call brute force. So the attacker is just going to keep trying and keep trying to log in until they are successful. Now, most times this one's not successful because the site will have a limit on the number of times that you can actually um, log in. Uh, there's some other technical ways that a brute force attack can be successful, but I, I won't get into that uh, here now. Um, something called a dictionary attack is important to, to understand what it is when you think about how to craft your own password. So commonly used words are easier to crack in a password because you basically take a list of all the commonly common um, English words, and actually sometimes they do it in other languages as well, and they basically just run through um, all the various um, passwords. Now, in the event, I'm going to get a little technical here for a minute, but bear with me. In the event of a compromise of a provider where they receive a copy of where all the passwords are stored, um, typically passwords are encrypted and specifically what we call hashed, which means the password is not stored as you entered the password. The password is stored um, in, a, um, in a manner that you can't decipher the password. And a hash is a particular type of encryption that can't be decrypted. Now, why is this important? Because if a hacker gets access to a database of all the password hashes, they're no longer limited by the limit on the number of times you try to log in. So how do you, I said you can't decrypt a hashed password, but what they can do is they can run through a commonly list, a common list of known passwords um, against standard hashing encryption algorithms, because there's a standard set of hashing encryption algorithms, and then they'll match those hashes. So when you use a dictionary attack, it makes it faster to do a brute force attack. Hopefully I didn't lose you there, but I thought that was important. Um, and then there's other types of attacks, like if you're sitting in, you know, a, a coffee shop, um, it's it, it could be easier to uh, install a keylogger, for example, if you're not using your own laptop, but you're logging into a public laptop, um, or you could accidentally download a, a virus that would install a keylogger on your laptop, that, that would then capture um, the password. And lastly, credential stuffing is just another type of attack where uh, a uh, attacker will use the passwords that were identified from another breach to try to um, log into a different account, which is, again, why we don't want to reuse any of our passwords. And lastly, hopefully we've done all the things that I just talked about and uh, we never get into a situation of being hacked, but even the best of us 
um, sometimes end up in this situation. So what do we do if we've been hacked? First of all, if it's specific to one of your banks or your service providers, you should immediately call them and ask them to lock or freeze your account. That will prevent any additional exposure to you, you know, whether that's disbursement of bank uh, of um, money from your bank or changes to things like beneficiaries. We don't want any further um, changes or or money uh, removed from your account. So you should call them immediately and remember the official channel. So we're going directly to the website of the bank and we're finding either the phone number or another way to contact them rather than through any sort of uh, reach out that they've provided us. Um, also, um, companies often use physical mail to notify when you may have been involved in one of their data breaches, and they are required by various regulations by state to, uh, one, notify you of the data breach, and in many cases, they're providing you option to enroll in some something, for example, like credit monitoring for free that they'll pay for X period of time. And so you should take advantage of that. But first of all, you should be looking in your mail for any of those notifications. If you do uh, experience any sort of identity theft, the specific place to report that is to the FTC and that's through the identitytheft.org site. Again, that will be in the follow-up materials. And then lastly, there is a great site, um, the Identity Theft Resource Center, that you can find a lot more information about how to proceed if after you've reported your identity theft, you know, what to do to continue to protect yourself after something like, you know, registration of a rogue credit card using your social security number, for example. So a lot of great resources there that hopefully you'll um, have as a takeaway to um, protect yourself in advance of any potential identity theft or other types of cyber attacks. All right, well, with that, I think we are going to turn it back over to Jeannie to help us with any Q&A. Yeah, wonderful. And again, thank you, Ariel. A wonderful presentation, very informative. And we have had a few questions come through uh, the Q&A. The first one is, is a question about um, online searches and the safety of that. Is it better to use a service like a DuckDuckGo or Firefox rather than Google? So the way I would answer it is it's less about what tool you use and more about what you're using it for. So you shouldn't use any sort of search to enter personal information into the search bar. Uh, so uh, especially with the introduction of AI now, there are there might be enticing to ask a question, for example, in a browser, but it might require you to put some sort of personal information in it. So the best way to protect yourself is not so much worry about the browser that you're using, but instead just not use it to enter any sensitive information. Now, a second question that came in, um, what are the best ways to back up my personal data? Should I be using an external hard drive or a cloud-based storage like a Dropbox? Sure. So I think the answer to this question is personal as long as we have the right controls in place. So you can sync your data with something like a Dropbox, but go, going back to one of my slides about access controls, it's important to leverage the access controls that something like Dropbox would provide. So by default, your Dropbox account won't have two fa uh, multi-factor authentication enabled. So if you're going to use that as your choice, then just make sure you're enrolling in the, the multi-factor authentication. Now, of course, a physical copy of your data on an external hard drive isn't susceptible to an online attack, but it might be more susceptible, for example, to uh, law, personal loss, right? You might lose track of it, uh, you might move. Um, so if you do use an external hard drive, make sure that it comes with uh, encryption. And uh, typically that is uh, encrypted with a password. So back to the earlier guidance, make sure you don't use a common password. Instead, you're using a longer passphrase uh, to encrypt the data on the external hard drive. But I think as long as you're using the uh, controls that I've mentioned, I think either of those options is appropriate. Now, is Apple's new password app okay to use for password management? 
Google's new password app. Um, it might be the Safari browser based. If if you're, I'll I'll phrase this in the form of a question. If if you're referring to the browser based um, password manager, then I would say it's similar to the risk that I described in terms of um, not using a browser based one, and instead. I would use a separate one. Now, if Apple offers a separate password manager, um, then I would say it's probably fine. But unfortunately, I'm just not as familiar um, with that one. Now, what should I do if I get a suspicious email from Schwab or my bank uh, or any other financial institution? Um, so if you specifically, if you're receiving one that looks like pretending to be Schwab, then you should reach out to um, Jeannie or one of the others um, through One Digital that will help you. Um, it's probably a good place to start with any sort of phishing email related to a financial institution, um, but either through um, Jeannie and the One Digital team or, you know, figuring it out separately, the best way then to report that is through those official channels. So Jeannie, anything you would add to that last point? Yeah, absolutely. If you see something that looks suspicious, that you kind of that that it, it doesn't feel quite right, it um, you know just send us the email, forward it to us, and say, "Is this legitimate?" We can reach out to Schwab and say, "Hey, did you send this to them?" We can look and say, "Oh yeah, this there's something off with this." I see. You know, if I hover my mouse over the email, um, it's not coming from Schwab. Or we look and 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 we can identify some things that are maybe necessarily common, but but certain things to look for in emails um, with that. But most importantly, just if it doesn't seem right, send a copy to one of us at, 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 the, at the One Digital office and we'll look into it for you. And, you know, something I didn't mention earlier in like the spot the scam type of slide is make sure when you're looking at the sender that you're not just looking at the display name, but actually the email address. So depending on whether you're on your phone or a laptop, you might hover over it or you might have to click it. But it's important to look at the contact card of the sender directly because they might put in the display name, you know, Schwab. But when you look at the actual email address, it's, you know, abcd at gmail.com, right? So look for the domain itself. And um, is it really the domain that you're expecting? Uh, domain being the part after the at sign. Um, and that's a good indicator that it's not potentially um, legitimate. And I would say overall, better to be overly cautious. Um, so if it ever, if you're, if, if you ever think it might not be legitimate, it's, your instincts are probably right. And best to go with that, that gut reaction. Now, what do you think of services like Norton LifeLock? So when we think about identity theft, I think it's important to look at um, two types of capabilities. One is proactive monitoring, identity monitoring. And then the second is if we've experienced, if we have known exposure of something like our social security number, um, we may have to make more proactive decisions about how to freeze things like our, um, our credit. So um, it depends on which of those situations you're in. If you're in a situation where you want to proactively protect yourself, then you don't necessarily need to go as far as um, locking your, your credit. Now, on the other hand, if you don't plan on enrolling in any new credit cards, you know, putting in a new mortgage, anything that would require that, then um, locking your credit is not a terrible option. But I think things like Norton and others, again, that you might be offered through certain um, breach monitoring is always a good option. And uh, I do the same for my family. We had a question come in asking about the password manager names again. Um, and, and we have those. We're going to be sending out the presentation, uh, the, the the video a webinar that we're doing will also send out the PowerPoint. Um, but Mary Ariel, if you could just kind of review those again and um, if there's pros and cons to any of them that you're aware of. Absolutely. So the three that we talked about were um, LastPass, 1Password, and um, KeyPass, I think. Um, and I'm actually trying to be uh, agile and look up the Apple password manager while we're talking. Um, so this is something that is part of the Apple software. Um, and one thing that it does is also suggest 
passwords. So this is like, think about if you are on your phone, um, you might uh, go enter, you know, you're going to sign up for a new um, site, then it might suggest a password for you. Um, that on a phone is sufficient. The way that the Apple path, the way that the Apple password manager stores the passwords on your phone is through the passcode that you create on your phone. So we didn't talk about this, but it's important to have a passcode to your phone as well as a strong password on your iCloud account. If you do those two things, then the Apple password manager uh, would be um, sufficient. But remember that first password is really the keys to the kingdom because if you compromise that password, to, and this is true for any password manager, right? If you compromise that password, now you have access to all the passwords. So I don't know if I explicitly said this, but in the password manager itself, whether it's LastPass, 1Password, or Keeper was the third that we mentioned, there will be a master passcode, passcode that you have to set up. You want to ensure that you're using a strong passphrase uh, for that so that you're not giving away the keys to the kingdom. Now, an additional question about Wi-Fi at home and concerns about that. So if you have Wi-Fi and you have a, a like a security password to log in, is there anything else you need to do to kind of protect your home and protect your, uh, your, 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 your home internet? Yeah, um, may, maybe an unpopular popular answer, but you know, I think sometimes we do overly scare ourselves. Like we read about things and we might, um, we might worry about um, things like um, wiretapping or um, essentially the digital version of that over Wi-Fi. I would say my answer is my personal opinion is that um, I don't think we need to worry about that. I think the the attackers focused on that are really for the purpose of um, espionage. So unless you're, you know, a government uh Official, you probably don't need to worry about that. What is important is just to have like a you know a basic password on your on your Wi-Fi and um, you know change it if you ever have to give it to somebody that you don't trust. But um, you know I don't. That's not something that is actually commonly in a in a common in, you know a typical household that we need to worry about. Another question about we or oh, sorry Webroot does Webroot Wi-Fi security have any value? Also, any opinion on Webroot for security monitoring services? So some um, routers or um, what, what are called like mesh networks, which are Wi-Fi extensions that we might use in our homes beyond like the um, either the cable or the fiber um, wireless that is provided to us in our homes come with additional security features. So, for example, um, you might have a service where you have to install an app and then you can see on the app all the devices that are connected. Um, and you'd be surprised how many things in your house actually connect. So like your refrigerator <laughs> and things like that. You, so you might have a long list of things that end up connecting to your Wi-Fi. But it is a good way to keep track of, you know, the things that we've allowed um, to be on our network. And so um, those wouldn't be... Uh, out of the box typically for um for a router but there are they are kind of like a good option to further um protect ourselves um the other thing is if we if if you have children in the home you know some of these services also provide additional controls that might limit the um access that a child may have on the internet or, or whether it's the time you know you might you can also restrict like after 8 p.m they can't use the internet um so I think things like that are, um, you know, help, help, uh, helpful. Um, antivirus in general um, is like Webroot as an example are good uh, tools to use on our laptop. So um, from like a, a work perspective, you know, we have antivirus that runs on all of our laptops. I didn't mention that, but it's a good point. Um, in addition to keeping our software up to date, we it's a good practice um, to use some sort of uh, antivirus or anti-malware, which you can typically find um, for pretty inexpensive. How secure are VPNs? Um, so we, a, a, yeah, I said, was there some information, maybe they were selling information or somebody was selling information from VPNs? 
Um, so a VPN is a virtual private network, um, and typically um, a VPN is used um, in a corporate setting, but you can also, um, in some cases, use it um, personally. So what the purpose of VPN is, if you're sitting in an unprotected wireless network, so for example, you're in the airport, you don't control who connects to that wireless network. If you're running a VPN, all of your web traffic gets routed through your VPN rather than over the public Wi-Fi. And so if you're transmitting your, if you're logging into your bank account, for example, while in the um, airport, then if you're not using a VPN, you might be susceptible to what's called a man in the middle attack where somebody might be listening, watching the uh, traffic over the web. So a VPN is a good tool, specifically when you're working in a public, uh, working on a public Wi-Fi. But if you're at home, you don't need a Wi-Fi. I'm sorry, you don't need a VPN because um, you have control over, you know, who is connected to your home network. And a question came in about artificial intelligence and cybersecurity. Is there anything to be worried about? Uh, well, I could talk about that for the next hour, but um, I would say from a consumer basis, the thing to worry about the most is it, the sensitive data that we're potentially putting in it. So more and more uh, tools are actually embedding AI capabilities into them, like Bing, for example, the Microsoft browser embeds AI capabilities into it. And so it's more enticing to ask these AI browsers or things that use AI questions, but you might be entering sensitive information in order to get the answer that you're looking for. So the best practice is use them, but don't use it to enter anything that you wouldn't want the company, you know, that you're, that you're, um, that is hosting that uh, AI provider to have access to. One but I'll just say one, sorry, I'll just say one other thing. I said I love this topic. So um, AI is being used, though, against us also. So phishing emails used to be a lot harder or a lot easier, excuse me, to detect because it was commonly, you know, maybe it was a non-English native speaker who was sending the phishing email. And so you could kind of look at like, oh, the grammar issue or spelling or whatever. But now a lot of times phishing emails are AI generated. And so some of the things that used to be easier to spot or actually now a little harder, which means we really have to follow those three steps and we have to slow down and we have to check and we have to no, not act quickly. Well, wonderful. We're, we're coming up on time here. So I just wanted to, again, thank everyone for attending this webinar on cybersecurity today. Um, and if you have any other questions, just please feel free to reach out to us in the Booten office. We can you know, forward them on to Ariel. We can answer them as best as we can. Um, we, we will be sending a copy of the recording out to everyone who is a participant. Um, it'll have the slides as well, which again, um, to Ariel's point, having those links um, for some of the web websites. Um, so we'll be able to access that as well. Um, and then finally, a big thank you to Ariel for her time today. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise with with us um, and have a wonderful day. Thanks a lot. Have a good one. Take care.